I was talking with this this bloke over here in the sweatshirt right before we came on. He was wondering about tonight. And he was telling me, oh, you're doing a thing on shadow work. Well, that's very cool because I've just been reading Ken Wilber, who's this, uh, this philosopher, this American philosopher, very active over the last 30 years. And, and Ken's whole thing is about taking all of the dis, disparate, disjointed, scattered fragments of our world and finding a, a, an, a, an evolving map that we can use to put them all back together in a way that lets everyone have a piece of the, the human puzzle, you know, in a way that honors the partial truth of everyone's experience. And uh, something that, you know, he talks about, that Ken talks about specifically, something I wanted to bring up when we were talking about Vipassana and something that, I want, you know, that, that your whole story really keyed off for me. Uh, has to do with spiritual, the difference between the kind of spiritual work that we've grown up being taught, you know, if we've been taught at all, um, you know, that, that we, we learn to let go, we learn to disidentify, we learn to separate from, we learn to poke our head out over the rational water, I mean, over the emotional waters into the rational air and get a breath, you know, gain some perspective, you know, but then there's this whole other thing, which is that that's not what shadow work really is. That's the first step of shadow work. And that's why in all of these contemplative traditions, we end up with what they call the dark night of the soul. Because everybody spends all this time disidentifying from everything in their life until I'm not my history, I'm not my body, I'm not my family, I'm not my, my thoughts. And I'm, I'm nothing, and this is awesome, I'm nothing. Except then you can't work in the world and you're confronted with the, the horrible truth that you are all of those things too. That, that you, know, you always get to that bigger, more inclusive reality. So if you push all the way to the very end to the point where I am nothing, I am none of these things, I am totally liberated of all qualities, then the only more inclusive truth that you can get to is I'm all of these things. And that's why activist and spiritual leader Sri Aurobindo, who's a, a British educated Indian man in the early 20th century, said that he felt that it was his responsibility to get people enlightened first, to get people identified with the totality of their experience first. And then you can drill into it and you can start to explore all of these other things that are me too. And when you start doing that, because if you're, if you're not this and you're not that, then what reason do you really have to act? But if I am all of these things, then suddenly they're a part of me and I have no reason to treat them with, with violence, you know? So this is like, for me, I like to look at it as a process, like the word tantra, you know, to expand, to take my 10 favorite songs and make the whole world my favorite piece of music, to take everything and make it a part of that, that story so that I'm not leaving anything out. If I find something, I include it, you know? And this isn't like willy-nilly, like everybody gets the same, obviously I'm not gonna give the same weight to those voices that are destructive to all of the other voices, but they get their place because those energies can be important. They, you know, either, you know, a necessary destruction or, or, you know, they can be repurposed. They can be used to, to make something meaningful. So there's a, to me, there's a structure to the way that this works. And then I'll get into this, the songs because hopefully I'll have given you some, some context. Which is that, yeah, it's important to, to disidentify a little bit, you know, to get out of it and take a look at it and say, what is this that's making me so upset that I'm so repulsed by or I'm so attracted to, you know, because it works both ways. Describe it, you know, really regard it as a naturalist. And if you can do that, then you found the piece that's required to actually deal with it. So you've done that first step, your Vipassana retreat, you know, that's step one, being able to look at this stuff at all. And then step two is where you start entertaining the fact that you might actually have something to learn from this. You know, that the guy that cuts you off in the street or the parents that hit you or, you know, the boss that's not listening to your story. You know, that there's something 
about whatever it is that you're reacting to that is a, a, a native intelligence within you that you can access that you're not paying attention to, that you're not listening. And you, you know, it's an acting exercise. Ask it a question. You know, what do I have to learn from you? Why am I, why am I recoiling from your intensity or you know whatever it happens to be? And then through that, you can kind of find that voice within yourself. You can realize that it's a it's a it's your own understanding that you're answering that question with. You know, there's there's that practice uh, of deity or guru yoga in the East where you visualize you know. Krishna or Jesus or whatever and you lock eyes, you make this eye contact with your visualization and, and you realize that all of these qualities that you've ascribed to this character are in your mind. That the infinite compassion that you wish to embody, you know, please Lord give me the strength to live this love in the world. The, Lord, the Lord's love that you're imagining is really your love and you're that love living in the world already. And so there's, I really encourage you to, to do what I did and experiment with guru yoga kind of in your, you know, in your like junkie yoga or your, you know, Illuminati yoga or your, you know, crazy people on the highway yoga. We've gotten a lot of that recently, you know, but you can't fault those people. I mean, I'm, a, I'm texting while driving too. You know?